Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. But this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this day that you created. I thank you for your presence, God, dwelling in our midst. We thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness. It's better than life itself. We thank you, Lord God, that you keep us from falling, present us faultless before your presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, be both majesty, power, dominion, both now and forever. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. For another opportunity, O oh God, to break the bread of life. Tonight, God, I cover my mind and my thoughts with the blood of Jesus. I cover my doorposts and possessions with the blood of Jesus. I overcome the devil through the blood of Jesus. I sprinkle the blood of Jesus and receive multiple grace and peace. I am made perfect through the blood of an everlasting covenant. My conscience is purged from dead works to serve the living God through the blood of Jesus. I have boldness to enter into your presence through the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that we have been cleansed by the blood. We've been sanctified. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We have the right, oh God, to come before you to lift up the name of Jesus. And God, I thank you that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. Every tongue that rises against us in judgment, we shall condemn. Because your word tells us, oh God, this is the heritage of the saints that are in the Lord and their righteousness of you. And God, we thank you that we are brought into right standing and right relationship with you through your son. We have access to come into your presence, O oh God, the boldness to come before you to receive grace upon grace, healing and deliverance. And I thank you, Lord God, tonight for the word of God, that you speak your word, O oh God, by divine unction of the Holy Spirit, that will inspire, that will edify, that will build us up in our faith, that will strengthen, that will encourage us, O oh God, to keep standing, Having done all to stand, that we stand with the full arm of God to quench all the fiery attacks of the enemy. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, be glorified, be exalted. And I thank you, Lord God, that we have received redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ and have been redeemed from the power of evil. I rebuke all spirits of torment and fear because I have peace with God through the blood of Jesus. I receive the benefits of the new covenant through the blood of Jesus. I receive healing and health through the blood of Jesus. I receive abundance and prosperity through the blood of Jesus. I receive deliverance through the blood of Jesus. I receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the anointing through the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord God, that the blood of Jesus washed our minds from the sin consciousness and that we're able, God, to have the mind of Christ. And I thank you, Lord God, that the blood of Jesus bear witness to our deliverance and our salvation. And we thank you that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Jesus resisted unto blood, and his blood gives me the victory, O God. And I thank you that we have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord, O God. Doesn't matter what comes our way, that we're able to stand in the victory. It's already been provided. And I thank you, Lord God, that I rebuke and cast out all spirits of guilt, shame, and condemnation through the blood of Jesus. I break the power of sin and iniquity in my life through the blood of Jesus. My heart is sprinkled and purified by the blood of Jesus from an evil conscience. And I thank you, Lord God, that I rebuke Satan and the accuser of the brethren through the blood of Jesus. I command all accusers to depart through the blood of Jesus. I rebuke and cast out all spirits of slander, accusations through the blood of Jesus. And I release the voice of the blood against demons and evil spirits that would accuse and condemn me. And I thank you, Lord God, that I've been set free by the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus from sin and iniquity to stand firm in righteousness and truth. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining tonight. God bless you. God bless you. I don't know about you, but I feel good because the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. It doesn't matter what comes my way. We can keep on standing, being covered with the presence of the Lord to keep us from all the attacks the enemy brings our way to knock us off our course, to even catch us off guard. Even when the enemy comes in like a flood, and he catch you off guard. God said he still raised a standard against him. And the standard is the presence of the Lord to guard and protect and shield you. Just like God did with the children of Israel. When they were faced with the Red Sea before them and Pharaoh's army behind them. Moses began to cry out to God and God told him, don't worry about it. I will, I will set a hedge of protection around about you. And so he did. God set a pillar of fire between the Egyptians and the children of Israel where they could not come near them. In other words, God raised a standard against the enemy in their lives. And God will do the same thing today in our lives as we trust in him and stand on his word because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And that's something we must know as a believer and, and have a stern conviction in our hearts that no matter what comes our way, we're standing under the protection of and the covering of the Lord himself. So I want to start out tonight reading our devotion from the book, More of You, God, by Jackie Doxon. And it says for March 2nd, Lord, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable today. I can feel you stretching and changing me. It feels really weird. It gives me a feeling of being totally out of control. However, I know you're taking and not launching me to a place I can go with your help and guidance. Father, you have given me a vision. Now I have a dream, Lord. Until recently, for, for so long, I could not even dream. Now I have written the vision on paper and it is plain and clear. I will adhere to what you want me to do. Lord, you have an appointed time for me. Father, I am making myself available to you, Lord. I'm working with and thankful for more of you, God. And that is so beautiful and so amazing to know that God stretches us in order to change us. Sometimes it becomes uncomfortable when God begins to change things in your lives, but we have to keep on looking unto the hills which come with our help, keep trusting and depending on the Lord and with confidence knowing that no matter what's going on, God has a plan. And in that plan is, is a vision. And that vision is a dream. And God has a purpose, the reason why he created you, to launch you into this, this plan he has for your life to make you prosperous in the things of God. So it's so important to have a vision and write that thing down and declare that over your life. As long as God presents it before you, Keep that vision before you. Keep praying over that vision. And keep watching God manifest that vision. And I guarantee it will come to pass at the appointed time that God has set in motion in your life. God already has, has an idea and he knows what's going to happen in your life. But a lot of times we miss the mark because we're not seeking God for ourselves. We're hearing other people seeking God for us, but we're not taking the time out to spend time in God's word, to spend time in prayer, seeking God's face for divine guidance and direction. But I guarantee when you do that, God will open up the windows of heaven. He'll pour out a revelation upon you. He'll give you insight into the mysteries of the gospel. He'll give you a new vision. And that vision will be clear and it'll, be, it'll come to pass in your life at the point in time God has set in destiny for it to be. And when he does what he's going to do in your life, I guarantee you receive the benefit of it because of your faith in God's word that he's able to bring it to pass. So tonight we're going to talk about the spirit of death. The spirit of death. And this is a subject that a lot of people, a lot of pastors don't really uh, touch on. They don't talk about is the spirit of death. And the reason why a lot of people don't talk about it is because they're, they're fearing death themselves. And if you are a born-again believer and a child of God, there is no reason to fear death because 
death is in, in Christ Jesus hand. When he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead, he defeated the death and the grave. He said, oh, death, where's the sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? Why? Because he's defeated the power of death. So when a child of God dies in the Lord to be absent in the body, it's a guarantee you will be in the presence of the Lord. So, so we don't have to fear death because death is in God's hand. And if God has it in his hand, guess what? He has you in his hand. And he already knows the appointed time. He already knows the season. He knows the moment when your life is going to cease from existing. But he knows it's going to be a pleasurable thing to be in his presence for eternity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. I'm going to read verse uh, 21 and 22, and then I'm going to read 26. So it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. It says, for, this, for since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. That's a wonderful message. One man, since the beginning of time, in the book of Genesis, when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, death was introduced to all mankind. So by one man, Adam, came death. But then by Christ, defeating death, rising from the dead, it says, in fire, by Christ, all shall be made alive. How? Because the new life, when you accept Christ in your heart as Lord and Savior, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things have passed away. That means your old nature is dead. And all things have become new. The newness is the relationship, the new lifestyle that we gain as a benefit of receiving Christ in our heart. Therefore, every precious promise God has for you, it is yours. And you can have it. No strings attached. No devil in hell can stop it. Why? Because Christ has won the victory. The song says, you know, hallelujah, Christ has won the victory. Why? Because he rose again from the dead. Verse 26 says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And this is talking about in the end time. When Christ comes for the body of Christ, it says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is the spirit of death. Why? Because at that time, death will have no more power in existence, even in life today. Many people are dying because of different things going on in their lives. Their bodies are sick, afflictions, whatever it is, accidents, people shooting them, doesn't matter what it is. But he says in the end, this spirit of death is gonna cease from existence. Then it says 27, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under his feet, under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. So, and what it's saying here, that when Christ defeat, defeats death, so all things will be brought low underneath, under his authority, which is under his feet. So because of this, when you receive him, it says everything is brought low under his authority, under his feet. So, although the spirit of death is not mentioned specifically by the name in the Bible, there are numbers of indications that death is more than just a condition or term. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and this is in the English Standard Version, the English Standard Version, it says, And you were dead, in the trespasses and sins. So because of this, hallelujah, give me one second. Glory to God. Okay, it says, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, the following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we are all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, 
and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, verse 4, being rich in mercy, because of his because of the great love which he hath loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and is seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the coming ages might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Hallelujah. So, because Christ defeated death at the cross through his resurrection, when he rose again, death lost its power. And it says, you were dead in your trespass and sin. Every person in the, in the human race has been dead because of sin. And you got a lot of folks still dead men walking. Why? Because they haven't came to the new life in Christ Jesus. And because they're separated from relationship in Christ Jesus, they're still living according to the dictates and the standards of the flesh. And they're still living in the darkness of the world as sons of disobedience. Why? Because they're falling after their father, the devil. The devil has been given the assignment and the authority over every creature of the world. But he loses his grip and his power over you the moment you accept Christ Jesus in your life and you give your life to him. Then Christ comes in, takes dominion over the spirit of death. He takes that old nature, he puts it to death, and he brings you to the new life that's in himself after the resurrection. And because of this, he says, you have been saved through, by grace through faith. So by faith are you saved through grace, which is God's ability, God's power to, to transform your life from darkness to light and bring you into right relationship and right standing with himself through the Father, to the Father, through the Son. And it says, not a work so as any man should boast. So it's nothing you can do on your own measures to earn this salvation but believe by faith that through God's grace, you're saved. So this is what the word is talking about. And it says we once lived according to the passions or the dictates of the enemy in our flesh. So because of that, we were children of wrath because of disobedience. But thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus because of his grace. We have been saved. Therefore, we can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in the time of need. So even in our shortcomings and our failures, even as a born-again believer, we have an advocate who forever liveth and abideth to make intercession for us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And God promises he will deliver us. Death and hell. Revelations 20 and 14 tells us that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Let me go to that scripture. Revelations 20. Revelations 20. In verse 14. It says this here. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's the second death. When you die the first death, there's a second death that's going to take place, which is the death of getting rid of hell, getting rid of the power of hell and death. And he said they would cast a lake of fire. Why? Because that's the end time. When Christ comes back in the end, he's going to do away with hell and death. He's going to do away with the power and the, the influences of the enemy because the enemy is going to be cast to the lake of fire for eternity. And those who follow his pattern, his lifestyle, who does not submit and yield themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ will follow Satan to the lake of fire. And that's where their destiny would be for eternity. Then it says the second death. John was not speaking symbolically of hell in this passage. It is a place that actually exists. It would seem, therefore, that death here means more than mere definition 
of the last stages of the killer disease or fatal accidents. So death, this death here is more than just when people die from an accident or die from a disease. This is the, the actual spirit of death that's going to be cast in the lake of fire. Paul mentions that, that the last enemy shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, which we just read. In Revelation 20 and 10, Revelation 20 and 10, it says, we are shown, we are shown the line of events that will take place, hallelujah, at the time. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then the great white throne judge of judgment of, of the unrighteous dead, when they shall, when they will be rewarded for their sins, after it said, only after that time will death and hell be cast into the lake of fire. So what's what it's talking about here says the devil that deceived them will be cast into the lake of fire. The same thing I just said. He said, and the beast and all the false prophets. In other words, everyone that denies Christ and does not follow him during the great throne of judgment. They will be rewarded for their sinful deeds. God promises that every person has reward coming in the end time. And it's determined by your, your belief system. Either you're going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your spirit. Or you're going to believe in the enemy and it leads you to death and destruction. Which is going to, in your eternity destination will be the lake of fire. So what it's talking about here is that you have a choice. Either you're going to live for Christ or you're going to live for the devil and, and end up in the lake of fire. So a definite distinction is made here between the devil and death in these passages. passages. Of course, death is under the direction of Satan, but according to the description of it, it would seem that death is some kind of being, possibly a fa powerful fallen angel. So it's an indication here in the revelation that death, like I mentioned earlier, is a spirit or a fallen angel. Because you got to remember that when Satan left heaven, when he was thrown out because of his rebellious and his, his, uh, uh, his, his rise up against God, want to take God's throne, want to be like God and all those things, the enemy took two thirds of the angels with him. And so they're now called fallen angels. Because they abandoned their position as servants of God. And so many people are falling after the nature and identity of the enemy. And they're going to end up just like it talked about in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 9 begins with the count of the bottomless pit. That is opened by the angel of God during the fifth trumpet judgment or plague. <coughs> Excuse me. Strange looking locusts and scorpion type creatures stream up out of the pit to sting the ungodly for a period of five months. You, when you get a chance, read Revelations, the book of Revelation. You're going to find so many references that refers to the end time and what's going to take place when Christ comes back. But then it talks about the, the, uh, the creatures, the locust-like creatures that like have scorpions, they look like scorpions, is going to be stinging the ungodly people for five months. This is Revelation. The torture of the sting is so terrible that the people will, will prefer to die, but death shall flee from them. Isn't that something? You're going to go through so much torment in the end, going to desire to die, going to want to die, but can't die. When Christ is about to make his appearance in the end time, all kinds of plagues are going to be released upon the earth. The judgment of God is going to fall upon the people of disobedience. And they're going to be suffering. Some are going to run to the rocks and say, rocks cry out, fall on us. They're going to cry out to the rocks. Rocks fall on us and can't die. You're going to be in so much torture and punishment to where no matter what you do, you can't escape the judgment of God. 
the supernatural insects have a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. In verse 11, this is in Revelations chapter 9, verse 6. In verse 11, it says the angel name in the Greek is Apollyon, which translates destroyer. He is still locked up in the bottomless pit, but the whole passage reveals that there is apparently a class of fallen angels whose chief work is to take life from the members of the human race and who have fallen prey to an accident or disease. So the destroyer or Apollyon, the angel that's, that's the king over the bottomless pit, can you imagine being in a dark place where you just stuck there and it's like no matter what you do, you can't escape it? That's what's going to happen in the end time. People are going to fall into this bottomless pit because of the destroyer and going to suffer forever. Then it says, let, now let us go back to Exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Many Christians believe that God killed the firstborn children whose parents had not placed the blood of the lamp on the doorpost of their home. But Exodus 20, 12, chapter verse 23, Exodus 12, chapter verse 23, puts a different light on the situation when read in conjunction with the above reference to the destroyer. For the Lord would pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord would pass over the door and will, not, I, and, I, and will not suffer or permit the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. In Exodus chapter 12 was the time where Pharaoh put a decree out to kill all the firstborn children. Because he was trying to get back at Moses. Because Moses was in order by God to speak a word to, to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh didn't want to let the people go. So God says, okay. So you want to come, come with me like this and destroy people that first born, I'm going to strike the Egyptians, but I'm going to tell my people, I'm going to cover them with the blood. So God has a remedy. Every time the destroyer comes to your life, God has a remedy. It's called the blood of Jesus. When you plead the blood of Jesus over your family, over your children, over your possessions, over your job, the enemy cannot touch you. Because when he sees the blood, it says he will pass by you. And this is the destroyer, which we have today, which is the enemy. Paul has something to say on this subject. Neither murmur ye, as some of them Israelites also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 10. That's the scripture talks about let me go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10 says, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmur, and were destroyed of the destroyer. But before that, verse 9 says, Neither let us tempt Christ. And some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. And this is talking about the rebellion that children of Israel committed towards the Lord. When God gave them stern orders to obey him and follow his commands, they murmured so many times and complained and rebelled against God. And God allowed the destroyer to destroy them. And Paul was telling the church at Corinth, don't allow yourself to get into the same mindset or attitude of the children of Israel where you complain and murmur about what God is doing in your life. It is important to understand that God does that God wasn't the billion in ex Exodus. In other words, God wasn't the billion. He was only the one with the power to keep the demonic destroyer from killing every firstborn child or for the matter of the whole family, whether there was blood on the doorpost or not. The death angel as the destroyer has come to be called and was not an agent of God, but of the devil. So a lot of people get this, this 
this message misconstrued concerning about the Israelites when God protected them with the blood on the doorpost, that it was God that was destroying the firstborn of the Egyptians. And God makes it clear that was the enemy behind that. God had the power and still does have the power to protect you from the death angel when he comes knocking at your door. One thing that I learned how to do over the years is that when I pray, I said, Lord, I thank you that I cover my mind and my body with the blood of Jesus. I cover my doorpost with the blood of Jesus. And when I lie down at night, that the deaf angel will pass me by, if it be thy will. Because we have the power in our mouth to speak life or death over ourselves. And a lot of people get into agreement with the enemy because of a sin consciousness. The mind that's not consecrated, this mind that's not on the Lord's word, because you're not feeding your spirit the word of God daily. So when the enemy speaks to you, you give in to it and you find yourself being defeated by the enemy because of the words you allow to come out of your mouth. So we got to get to the place where we recognize the importance of getting into agreement with God's word and studying God's word, knowing God's word for ourselves, getting that word in your spirit on a daily basis. Because the word would guide it would counsel, it would instruct you, it would lead you into sound doctrine. Paul told us, for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus also himself likewise took part of the same. Through That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. So it says here, this scripture here, for as much as children are partakers. So in other words, we are flesh and blood, partakers of flesh and blood. That means you, you're in relationship with flesh and blood. So then he also says, Christ also was the same way of flesh and blood. But through death, he might destroy the power of death. That is the devil. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross and he was buried. He went down to hell, defeated death and the grave, took the keys of, of life, the keys of death and hell, and, and he rose again from the dead. He defeated it. And that same power that defeated the enemy, defeated the enemy in your life. So you are victorious through Jesus Christ, our Lord, on a daily basis that when you believe it by faith, that no matter what the enemy brings you away, it has no power over you. So, the Bible has a great deal to say about death, and more importantly, what happens after death. Physical death and spiritual death are both a separation from one thing or another. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body, and spiritual death is the separation from the soul from God. When we understand in that way, the two concepts are very closely, closely related, and both physical death and spiritual death are reflected in the very same reference to death. So physical death is separation from one another, and spiritual death is separation from God, your soul from God. So we got to understand that there is two factors in our lives when we die. That's the separation from life itself, from other people, and then as a separation from God when your soul is not connected to God. And you have a lot of people are living a life separated from God because their soul has not been surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're still living dead. You're dead men walking. That means now that we can shout along with Paul after we have accepted Christ as our personal Savior. O death, where's thy sting? O grave, where's your victory? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. What does it all mean? If we are blood-washed children of God, we can stand against death in the name of Jesus as the Holy Spirit directs us. And death can be stopped from doing its deadly work. It means that those who have placed their trust and their faith in God's word do not have to fear death because Jesus has performed surgery on death and taken the stinger out. And as far as his followers, we are concerned, understand now that all of this dependency is upon the fact that as a child of God knows his right, 
according to the word of God and applies them if and when the situation demands and the Holy Spirit prompts us. So we have the power to overcome the spirit of death by our confession in Christ Jesus. We got to get to the place where we speak life over ourselves and not death. You know one thing about a child of God, so many Christian folk who confess to be a child of God are so negative. They speak so many negative things over other people, over themselves. When things are not going right in their life, they become weary, they become frustrated, become angry, become miserable. Your body get afflicted and you get into agreement with all these things and you forget about Jesus has power over all of that stuff. One thing about, about myself, I can literally say that when I'm sick or in pain, you never really know it because I don't confess it. I go on as if nothing even wrong with me sometimes. I can be in dire pain, but I keep on praising God, keep on declaring his word over my body and over my spirit. Why? Because we have the power to command our bodies to be at peace. When you speak the word of God over yourself, the word brings an influence by the Holy Spirit, which will release the anointing inside of you and begin to heal you. It is the anointing that heals. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke, but it's your confession that can deny the anointing or release the anointing. If your confession is always in agreement with everything negative, everything that's foul and demonic in your life, that's the result you're going to always end up. You'll never be healed. You'll never be delivered. You'll always be defeated. You'll always have trouble. You'll always have trials because of your confession. But I command you in the name of Jesus to speak life. Joshua told the children of Israel, he said, God says, I set before you life and death. Now choose life that you and your descendants may live. In other words, if you make a choice, make a wise choice. Let your choices line up with God's word and decree what God says about you and watch it happen. So what this means is that death cannot attack us prematurely. Just as God kept death from those, from taking those Israelites who had placed the lamb blood symbolic on their doorposts, there is actually Christians who are tricked by a deceiver into believing their time has come to die or snatch away in an accident when in reality it, God isn't through, isn't through with them yet. So just like the children of Israel placed the blood on their doorposts and believed God that that blood was going to protect them, we have to do the same thing. Take the anointing, oil. Anoint our head with oil as a symbolic that I'm covered with the presence of God and protected from death by the Spirit of God. But like it says here, a lot of believers are deceived in believing that their time has come to die because they don't believe God's word for themselves. You have a choice. If you're going to believe God's word for what it says and take it to heart or deny God's word and die. Here's a story. It says, a doctor friend of ours in Latin America had such an experience one day as he and his wife were returning home after a day of relaxation. An approaching car took his half, took half of his road out of the middle. And our doctor friend had, had to swerve towards the ditch to avoid a head-on collision. As in the case, it is in many countries around the world, there are usually people walking along the roads of a small Central American country. In missing the oncoming car, he hit a young girl walking along the shoulder of the road, throwing her some distance from the point of impact. He and his wife scrambled out of the car in a state of shock and ran over to, to where the little girl lay. She displayed all the signs of death. It seemed useless to even try to treat her medically. At that moment, he testifies that the Holy Spirit prompted him to rebuke the spirit of death in the name of Jesus. And when he did it with authority, immediately the color returned to her, the girl's cheeks and she started to get up saying she was all right. 
This story is an indication that we as believers can speak according to God's word when death comes into somebody that's close to you. If it's God's will for them not to die, you can command that spirit of death to loose them and let them go and it'll happen. This doctor hit this little girl and the Holy Spirit prompted him. In other words, spoke to him and said, rebuke that spirit of death. You have the power in your mouth to rebuke death or to receive death. And immediately when he rebuked the spirit of death, the little girl came back to life and she got up. The doctor was amazed at her rapid recovery. There were some cuts and bruises and to their immense relief, they were able to take the little girl home alive instead of a coffin or in a coffin. Not only had death been robbed of a victory, but Satan was defeated in his attack on the child of God. The doctor was spared the trauma of taking an innocent child's life through no fault of his own, as well as the legal harassment or hassle that would have ensued him because of his statute as a foreigner. So he was a foreigner in another country, hit a little girl, she, she died, and the Spirit of God raised it back up. <clears throat> so we have the same power, but we got to know our power. And the only way you're going to know the power you have is when you stand on God's word and speak God's word to yourself. True, it is appointed unto man once to die. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. But the appointment should be according to God, <clears throat> excuse me, should be according to God's calendar not the enemies. Your appointed time is not up to you when you're going to die. It's up to God. When God says it's time for you to leave, lose, lose your life or leave this earth, it's according to his standard, his, 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 his timing, his will, not your will. Satan is a murderer and a thief and a liar. He not, not only attempts to rob us of our salvation, health, children, and peace, and finance, but also of our years on this earth as Christians. Jesus puts it this way. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye would do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. John chapter 8, verse 44. Satan is the father of lies. And because he's the father of lies, Satan would tell you, hey, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God has abandoned you. God has forsaken you. Why? Because he wants you to doubt God's ability, God, doubt God's promises, doubt God's word. So he wants to deceive you and believe you out of your inheritance that's in Christ Jesus. Let me stress once again that we must be very sensitive to the fact that God's spirit speaking in such a situation, not ours. Every situation happening in our life, God is speaking to us to get our attention. And we got to get to the place where we recognize that when it's the enemy working against us or is God working against us? Because some things God will let happen to you when you're out of order to draw you back to him. But then there are some things in our lives that's of the enemy to trick you or deceive you or destroy you. But the power is of God that has the ability to keep you secure in his presence. But you got to be willing to let go of yourself, your own agenda, your own attitude, your own lifestyle, and give everything to the Lord. Once that is decided, you will find that when faith or unction of God springs in your heart or the spirit, you would know it without a doubt. Speak to death as you would any other spirit from the devil. But also remember to loose the spirit of life into, into the one you're praying for. Christians die by faith. When and how should a Christian die? A Christian should die 
as differently from a center as light is unlike darkness. <clears throat> In other words, as children of God, we die separated from the same lifestyle that, that sinners die because we're of the light and they're of darkness. Death for a believer should be a promotion to the higher rank, not a fear-filled, trauma-laden tragedy. The Old Testament patriarchs called the children around the bed and prophesied over them, then simply gathered their feet up into the bed and yielded up their spirits. I heard recently of an elderly Christian man who announced to his children at a family gathering, I'm going to die at 3 o'clock p.m. tomorrow afternoon. I want you to be, be, uh, be there because I have something special to tell you before I go. The children and the grandchildren were shocked and cried. You can't mean this, Grandpa. We don't want you to die. But he insisted that it would take place as he said. The next morning, one mentioned another thing about what happened the night before. It said no one mentioned anything about the, what happened the night before. And the aged grandfather played games and jokes as usual and the same as ever. But just before 3 o'clock p.m., he said, oh, it's almost time. Come on, everyone, into the bedroom. He laid down on his bed and spoke, telling how he wanted them to live th their lives after them, after him. And at 3 o'clock p.m., he entered into the presence of the Lord as gently as if he, he had taken a heavenly elevator. This man spoke a word that at 3 o'clock p.m., he's going to die. And because he believed that, at 3 o'clock p.m. the next day, the time he had deemed that was going to happen to him, it happened. And the man died and entered the heaven. Jesus says in the parable of a rich man and Lazarus, that the angel carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom in the bowl of the righteous dead before Christ's death and resurrection. St. Luke chapter 16, verse 22. After Jesus rose from the dead, he took the keys of hell and death with him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Because of that victory, the Christians now go directly to heaven after death. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that with we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. What we, he said, for we walk not by faith, we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is so good. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 6 and 6 and 8, 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. So it's a guarantee that when a Christian dies, we're going straight to heaven to be with the Lord. When a sinner dies, they're going to the place of purgatory, waiting on the judgment, where they're going to end up in the lake of fire. Not only do we live by faith, but we must die by faith. Why do Christians fight and strain to stay on this earth when God has a time come for them to pass onto the place where Jesus prepared for them? Could it be a lack of faith or actual knowledge of God's word? Since, since they are unsure of their right and, rights in God, they fear the unknown just as a sinner does. But this need not to be. God's word is very clear. If we have accepted Christ and are living according to his word, death no longer has power over us. Just as Jesus defeated death, so we will also, if we use the word of God in place of our hands. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. Speak the words of God and believe God's word. Act on what God has said and live, not by, and live by the words of God. When the time to step over into the next world, the Holy Spirit is perfectly capable of advising you that you have arrived at the going home phase of your life. That is that time when the angels come to take you where you, where sorrow will be obliterated and you will be in the very presence of the Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ. So in other words, when the time comes for you to leave this world, God already knows. He already has it in place and his angels will come and escort you to the heavenly place 
in the presence of Jesus Christ for eternity. David speaking of God's word, pen these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. Psalms 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We are not merely numbers to God. Just as we help ease our children over difficult areas in their lives, so will God be with us to help us through the last miles of this life. Do not allow Satan to rob you of the years God has given you to live and then believe God for a peaceful home going. That is the heritage of God's children, not one minute before or one minute after he calls us into his presence. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore choose life that thou and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 9. Satan tries to deal a death blow to all areas of our Christian lives. If he can take the believer's life, then Satan will try to kill your finances, your marriages, your friendships, and family relationships. You, the believer, can take, take your total place of authority in Christ Jesus and bind the enemy. You can bind the enemy. Begin to back him away from what is rightfully yours and speak the word of life into every situation. You got to speak the word of life in every situation because when you speak the word of God, God's word takes precedence over the enemy. Revelation 18.21, what I read earlier. 18.21. I mean, Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18.21. So we have the power in our mouth to stand against the wiles of the enemy, even when it comes to death. Jesus declares that I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. When we are following him, speaking the truth and the words of life in, into all areas of our lives, we're losing the power of Jesus into it. We're losing the power of Jesus into it, and his power changes everything. So we speak the word of God, his truth, and the word of God in our lives. We're losing the power of Jesus to change anything in our lives. So begin to walk closely daily in your relationship with God and he will direct your steps. He will sensitize yourself to a quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. But the righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 10 verse 2. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 2. But righteousness delivereth from death. So we got to choose that we're going to follow after God's word. Run for the prize and achieve your high calling. Dear Father, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Father, I choose life to reign supreme in my spirit, my soul, and my body from the day on. Satan, I rebuke you and your spirit of death. You would try to destroy me, but you have already been condemned to the lake of fire. I refuse your destruction and robbery. Lead me now in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your spirit of life that dwells in me and blesses everything I have put my hands to do. I know I have authority to bind and loose according to Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. You stand behind your word to perform it in me. I glorify you and praise you for your great mercies to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this concludes our lessons in this book. The strong man, his name, was his game. But there are some other points in this book at the end of the chapter I'm going to read next week. We discuss that, give you more um, advice on how to overcome the stronghold and spiritual warfare. Because the enemy has lost his power he lost his authority. He lost his grip. And you got to believe that by faith that you are more than a conqueror. And I guarantee when you do this, stand on God's word, you will find yourself living a more freer and a fruitful life, surrendered to Lord Jesus Christ. 
So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you may be a backslider, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And I guarantee God is going to restore you. He's going to refresh you. He's going to revive you and bring you back to right standing with himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you as a sinner or a backslider. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. And wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord God, for saving me, restoring me, reviving me, and strengthening me to overcome the temptations, the trials, and the tests the enemy brings my way. As I stand in your word and trust you and believe that you have the power to destroy anything the enemy brings my way in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let the anointing fall afresh on me to give me the power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, God bless you. Welcome to the family of God. Thank the Lord for restoring you, those of your backsliders. And I guarantee that from this day forward, your life is going to change. Because God doesn't leave us the same way. He changes us every day from glory to glory, from strength to strength, to become more and more like him as we learn how to yield and surrender and release our minds, our body, our soul, our will, and our emotions into his hands. And I guarantee you will see the benefit of it and the fruit and the promises God has for your life activate in you to cause you to be blessed all the days of your life. So, Lord, I thank you tonight for this lesson. I thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and mercy. I pray your word has not fallen from deaf ears. But, Father, we learned something tonight to become more and more stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to walk by faith and not by sight. Father, I rebuke the spirit of death, spiritual and physical death, that will come against the people of God on this day and from this day forward. I release the spirit of life that flows from the anointing to heal and deliver and strengthen the faith of those, Father God, who are believers to keep trust and independent in you and standing in your word in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord God, that you help us to do better, to walk by faith and not by sight, to be more surrendered to your lordship and your authority. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. I thank you for allowing the Spirit of God to minister to your heart. Let this word marinate in your heart. Let this word continue to restore you and bring you back to the place every day where you have a desire and a hunger for righteousness to be filled. And allow the word of God to be in the flow through you. And I guarantee you'll be, be more grateful for what God is doing in you and through you as you trust him and his word. Amen. If you desire to sow a seed into this ministry, I'm going to post the link tonight. And if you do, praise God. If you don't, praise God. Either way it go, God is still going to bless this ministry continually because he's a blessing God. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly. But while we ask or think, and I believe in seed sowing myself, because every time I sow a seed, God always restore me a harvest of blessings in return. It comes and does not come the way I expect it sometimes. It comes the way he wants me to receive it. And I thank God for that. But God bless you all tonight. Stay excited about Jesus. And know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he rules, he reigns, have dominion and authority in your life. And allow this word, like I said, to keep on getting God's word. Allow God's word to feed you like a shepherd feeds his flock. And I guarantee that word will bring a change in your mindset, your attitude will change, your belief system will change. Everything about you is going to change. Amen. God bless until next week. Shalom. Peace be unto you.